Now we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And more specifically, this is Science at SOAS, a, a program that has gone on a special series for the past semester, uh, courtesy Pete McGinnis Mark, who is an emeritus uh, science researcher at SOAS at UH Manoa, uh, and who has handled uh, what amounts to a course over the past semester. And today we're going to look back at that course, and we're going to look forward to that course too, and talk to Pete about how it was. Pete, was it as good for you as it was for us? Well, first of all, Jay, thank you very much for uh, hosting me on my show. Uh, yeah, it was great fun. I got to meet many of the graduate students within SOST and uh, help them a little bit in terms of public speaking. And uh, I learned a lot from it. I think the students did as well. And from my point of view, it's been a great success. You know, we did a movie about climate change and COVID, The Connection, last year. And, and one of the uh, scientists who spoke on the movie was uh, Angelique White. Um, yes. There were others, too. And every scientist who spoke said that it was really important now for scientists to be able to talk to the public. Because in the past, there hasn't been that much connection between science and the public. But now it becomes critical. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. And uh, two of Angel's postdocs actually appeared early in this season uh, of science at SOS. And I would not only say that, you know, the issues related to climate change, it's important that we communicate with the, the general public, but also just the wide variety of other research that is being conducted at SOS that affects everybody's lives here on Oahu, whether it's sea level rise or whether it's obviously with Red Hill and the water system there, um, when we have a, a tsunami or a volcanic eruption, not only uh, our researchers at SOST taking care of uh, the, the, the research side of it, but you know, many of the decisions that the state is making are based on the uh, results from SOST research. Yes, and this will be more and more in the future for sure as climate change gets worse, and it is and it will get worse. Uh, so, Pete, what, what is uh, SOS? You call it SOS. Uh, there are those around who call it SOS, but they're Sorry. geographically minded. Oh, what right. is that shirt you've got there, Pete? What is so that I, shirt? I, I, I've, got, I've got my SOS T-shirt on in celebration of today's event. So uh, if we have the first slide, SOST is the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology, and it's a real gem at UH Manoa. Um, obviously, um, people probably are not familiar, but there's a large number of research professors and instructors, over 200 of them. Uh, more importantly, we raise about $130 million a year in federal grants, and of course, uh, the, the follow through of those monies really helps the community in terms of uh, sustaining uh, parts of activities here uh, on the Wahoo. Um, there's a large number of graduate students uh, and many of these students go on to be really world leaders in some of the activities. For example, in my own field, some of our former graduate students now fly cameras around the moon. They're on the current Mars rover. Uh, we've had instruments going uh, to Saturn and Jupiter as well. So it's not widely known, but SOST has some phenomenal researchers, and we also train the next generation. Our students have been highly successful for over 30 years now. And it's, it's world famous, isn't it, Pete? Absolutely. Um, yeah. In terms of the oceanography, we, we've got this 75 meter long research vessel, which does deep water uh, research. Um, we're ranked probably fourth in the world as far as the kind of research we do in oceanography. Clearly, like for coral reef studies, 90% of all coral reefs in the United States are in Hawaii. So it makes sense. Our uh, Institute for Marine Biology, for example, is a world leader in that area. I mentioned our own space research. Um, you know, we're building our own satellites. Um, many of our students have gone on to work either with NASA or other universities. And, and the list goes on and on. Our renewable energy, for example, 
Hawaii is a phenomenal place to test smart grid technology and new batteries, for example, because it's a small self-contained island state, um, you can tinker with aspects of the smart grid to really understand what's going on in a much better way than you could elsewhere. So um, yes, ecosystem dynamics, um, some of the tropical meteorology, uh, deep blue water oceanography, you know, SOST is a world leader. We, we rank, uh, say, in the top 20 in most fields in the United States. And in some instances, we're in the top five. So it's a particularly good um, area of research to be in here in Hawaii. Yeah, silly you for retiring. You should have stuck around. Um, oh, no, I've got, I, I've got plenty of ideas. I, I, I haven't retired from research. I, I just uh, uh, have taken on an emeritus. Uh, position and and my my current uh, real interest is uh, trying to get a program to prepare geologic maps for the astronauts when they return to the moon probably in 2026. Hmm. So that's what I'm putting a lot of my effort into right now. Better hurry. <laughs> yes, better hurry. <laughs> <laughs> so Pete, let's look at slide two, and we're talking okay. about the four departments uh, in SOAS. Uh, so, um, and let's talk about you know where the, the the participants in the science and SOAS program have come from uh, among those departments. Okay, um, let me just uh, tell the viewers. I mean, I'm a geologist of sorts, and so um, my home department would be the Department of Earth Sciences, which was originally called Geology and Geophysics. And so I know most of the students in that department, and it's easier for me to um, persuade some of them to come on the show. Um, I am absolutely hopeless at atmospheric sciences, and so I don't have the network of people that uh, have, have come on the show from that department. I know individuals in the Department of Oceanography and in Ocean Resources and Engineering, but that sort of... Uh, give some idea of the diversity of candidate students that we could have brought on to the show, that there's a wide variety of skill sets from numerical modelers, people who go out into the field, um, some who work in laboratories, and we've got some really sophisticated instrumentation here at SOST, at University of Hawaii at Manoa, um, that you know, is world-class. And so many people, uh, have different backgrounds, and part of the challenge of this whole series, Science at SOS, was to ensure that there was this diversity of guests, uh, as well as um, you know, getting the graduate students to appear. Many of them had not been on live TV before, and so coaching them a bit on how to prepare materials as well as uh, present themselves during the show was an important educational experience for them. Are the ones who were not in geophysics and planetology as nice as the ones in geophysics and planetology? I think we have a great bunch of students across the board in, in SOS. Um, many of them were super enthusiastic, albeit somewhat nervous to come on the show. Um, you know, it, it, it was a little difficult at times to talk to, uh, say, an oceanographer who was preparing her next research paper uh, to persuade her not to um, worry about uh, preemptively talking about the results, because each of these shows was very much sort of a, a top-level discussion. Our goal was to try and inform the general public about some of the activities at SOS not to uh, go into the details of the latest research paper. So um, I know more of the students in earth sciences uh, and could talk to them offline about you know, the, the value of coming on the show. But from all of the other three departments, you know, we had representatives and that was pretty good. Yeah, well, you've been in, in, in and around the media for a long time, uh, ThinkTech, for example, but that's only one. Uh, did you find, I know you put a lot of time into preparing and helping them prepare for these, these segments. Uh, did you find that you were nervous, Pete? Uh, never crossed my mind. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> this, to be honest, Jay, this is so um, enjoyable and low key. Um, no, nerves never came into it. I mean, uh, if you go to a congressional hearing and you're trying to defend uh, the budget for part, your part of NASA, um, that's when you get nervous. So, um, <laughs> the first talk I ever gave was at uh, Caltech at a symposium with 600 people in the audience. That was nerve wracking. <laughs> with all due respect, a think tech show is fairly low key and very enjoyable. We want it to be that way. Let's go to uh, slide number three, which is a picture of all the guests that have appeared with That's you right. on the show, this very interesting group. And I noticed, let me just take a closer look at that. Most of them seem to be women, Pete. Uh, why is that? Two thirds of the uh, guests this semester have been women. Um, twofold, Jay. One is that there seems to be a trend within the, the, the school that more women are taking up graduate degrees uh, than the guys are. Um, so, you know, the, the population of candidates to come on the show um, is probably about 60% women, 40% guys. Um, but the other thing was that they have a great little network. Um, um, Marley came on the show in uh, uh, early February. And she has lots of friends and she just went up and she told her friends, hey, this is a great fun thing to do. Uh, and it turned out that quite a few of her friends were women. And so um, that sort of encouraged um, them to come on the show. And it made my life easier um, to just ask people who were almost volunteering, say, please bring me on the show when you get the chance. Um, and, and so Yes, it, it, it was uh, surprising to me as well that, as I said, two thirds of the uh, guests were women, but um, that's the way it turned out. Yeah, this was a kind of a volunteer thing. In other words, they would come to you. You would go out and, and publish, um, you know, the fact the show was taking place, but then they would respond and they would come to you. So this is their choice to be on the show. Right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, the, the original idea of making it a course uh, where they got university credit never actually panned out. Um, there was, uh, first of all, we, we started very close to the start of the semester, so we couldn't get um, this sort of thing accredited by the university. Um, but the other thing is that it was much easier to persuade a student to come on the show just for one lunchtime uh, presentation, as opposed to committing to be at the same place at the same time for 15, 16 weeks. So um, the, the course idea I thought was uh, interesting, um, but it, it never really panned out. And as a result, the show never really exploited the idea of having real-time questions uh, being sent in uh, by email so that uh, some things worked and some things didn't work for the show. Now, you know, as you said, uh, we're we're low key. We like to have we like to have fun, actually. And and uh, th this sounds like it it was that, and it's very important to us. But let me let me ask. You know, this reflects, uh, at least in SOS, um, an increasing number of women who are learning to be scientists, taking graduate degrees in science. You know, I think I think most people walk around the street thinking, oh, a scientist. A scientist is usually a man. But that's no longer necessarily the case. And I want to ask you about science in general, not only at SOS, but nationally and internationally. Are we seeing new dimensions in the participation of women? Uh, certainly, there are more women getting into the field now than there, there was when I was sort of just starting uh, my work at UH Manoa. And also, you know, added diversity, uh, trying to get Native Hawaiians involved. Uh, other minorities as well. Um, there's much more awareness in trying to sort of make science embracing for all, all uh, individuals. And for sure, there are more women uh, in my field. And I think that's also true, particularly in oceanography, um, as well as in atmospheric sciences. And we're starting to see uh, more women being given tenure track faculty positions and postdoctoral positions. And so the pipeline 
uh, for these other groups is starting to really produce some uh, exciting results. Let me go to the next slide, Pete. Uh, okay, this is the background work that you right. did for yeah. the show. And um, you, you did a lot of work to help them. And it's not only in the science, although partly it must be, it's in the presentation. Can you talk about what you did to help them and what these what these two views of the slide represent? Uh, absolutely. Um, so you're correct in saying that a lot of the work actually took place before the uh, the thirty minute show, and so you know I would identify a, a, a student guest, and about a week before they came on the show, I'd say you know send me some uh, ideas on on what you'd like to talk about, and on these. Uh, this slide here, we've got two different examples. Uh, uh, on the left-hand side, illustrations of original drafts of ideas. And you're probably well aware that it's tough to read either small print or, or, or uh, equations or something like that. So the original drafts on the left-hand side, one of the things I did was just to go through uh, and sort of um, spiff up and simplify. Uh, these illustrations. So the two on the right would be my take of what the student was trying to show, uh, making them as large as possible and as simple as possible, um, because we realized that you know, not all the viewers uh, are, are familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum, for example, or uh, any of the other science. Uh, and that also, um, if we go to slide five, the next one, um, it wasn't just the individual uh, slides to make them um, fairly simple. One of the other things which I really tried to work with the students on was to have a coherent story. So we didn't want to have five or six or 10 randomly selected slides as we are doing today. You know, there's some method to my madness in terms of the, the sequence in which material is presented. So you start off with an overview, you show a few examples of the science, and then hopefully draw to a conclusion. If we get enough time at the end, you ask the student, well, you know, what are you going to be doing uh, once you graduate? Or um, you know, has this um, produced some exciting results which are of value to the state, for example? So the two things, one, making each individual slide um, as um, intelligible to the viewer as possible um, was uh, time consuming, but then also working with the student, going back and forth, what order of the slides makes a coherent discussion for 30 minutes? And inevitably, some of them think they're going to you know, present 20 slides, some of them think of only three slides. And that timing has always been as you as a host have found out, you know, um, pacing the whole presentation is really important. And getting that across the soup, we thought this would be, say, the equivalent of an elevator speech, except it's 30 minutes. And so trying to um, instruct some of the students, some of whom are only in their second year of their PhD, others who are close to graduating, or uh, we had a couple of postdocs on board as well. So, you know, there's a different skill level um, and knowledge base that the students have. Yeah, as we discussed earlier, it's important that scientists, including, you know, postdoc scientists, um, you know, know how to present. And it uh, sounds to me like this was very valuable to the participants to hear from you about it, to work with you, to establish not only, um, you know, legible, understandable charts and graphs, but also to put them in a storyline so they made sense. Uh, right. and, and Lord knows that's a valuable skill in, in defending a dissertation. It's a valuable skill in presenting to industry. It's a valuable skill in presenting to the 600 members of Congress that were listening yeah. to your remarks, some of whom I am certain, I know they would have a lot of trouble wrapping themselves around the concepts you were describing. So the presentation is very important. Yeah, yeah. And to do it without... Uh, stumbling as you're, you're talking and to sort of if you've got individual points that you want to get across how does the student put that in her discussion so that you know, um, the, the viewer actually goes away 
realizing, oh, yes, there's two or three bullets that are really important. Yeah, very valuable for them. Well, let's go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, slide six. And, yeah. and this was, this was uh, some shows are really difficult to host. And I'd like to hear about those in particular. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't wish to pick on Kelly too much. But um, as I said earlier, you know, I'm a geologist. And so some of the students which I, I had on the show clearly were doing research that I didn't actually understand. Kelly's was one of them. She was using lasers to look at the um, potential uh, health of vegetation. Uh, and this diagram here basically shows that the color of the vegetation changes if it's sick. And so how can you use lasers uh, to understand that? And it was like the blind leading the blind almost. And so I, I, I was learning in real time something about the show. And the next slide as well, number seven, um, which uh, Kay Takazawa uh, had. Kay was talking about a topic called infrasound, which is sound waves that the human ear cannot hear because they're such low frequency. And for example, he presented um, a discussion on a media which uh, exploded over uh, Siberia back in 2013. And the diagram at the top, the one with the sort of yellow and red um, that's uh, so an acoustic sonogram of um, the different wavelengths of sound that you could hear and, and similarly the Tonga volcanic eruption which took place uh, in January of this year trying to understand how you interpret um, sound waves is something which I don't really do most most days and so trying to um lead the student through some hopefully intelligible questions and to give them a chance to showcase the kinds of things which they um have been studying perhaps for you know five years uh was one of the other challenges in contrast what was that, what was that like for you pete i mean you know, they always say that uh, science should be cross-disciplinary, that every scientist has to at least know about other areas of science, and who knows, that may feed into his or her specific area. Uh, so yeah. what was it like for you? You study in one area, it, and then you have yeah. to learn others. It, it, it's, it's great fun. You know, um, in retirement, you can afford to be a clock kick or an armchair academic sort of thing. Um, so... You know, it, it, it's a little bit outside of your comfort zone, uh, I've got to admit. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it, it really engages the student because they um, have to make a greater effort to uh, educate the, the person that they're talking to, let alone uh, show something useful for the audience. In contrast, if we go to uh, slide eight, mm -hmm which was Rose Gallo last week. Um, poor Rose, uh, she's a second year graduate student working uh, on Kilauea Volcano. And I let slip that, hey, this is something I've been working on myself for the last 40 years. And so- Poor, um, Ro poor Rose. Poor, poor Rose um, <laughs> was having a, an interviewer who, um, was asking a lot of historical questions about the Kilauea eruptions or, you know, sort of uh, uh, magma processes. And as a second year grad student, she may not even have had classes in some of the material which I was asking. So, you know, it, it, it's a mix and match. Um, throughout the semester, we had some students who uh, were quite senior and knew an awful lot about the topic. And, you know, it was a almost e even debate between the two of us, ones like Kelly and Kay. I had no idea at all what they were talking about. And poor Rose had an interviewer who had spent the last 40 years working on the topic that she's been involved in for 18 months sort of thing. So, You know, I know that you didn't treat it as a formal course and therefore you didn't 
give grades, but um, didn't, doesn't that put you as the instructor at a disability when you have to give grades about a disparity of knowledge on your part and on their part uh, when you have these various uh, different subjects being presented? Uh, how would you have graded them had you graded them? Um, I think one would have to know more about the um, the, the place of, of where the student is in his or her uh, degree program. Um, obviously, the postdocs are expected to be an expert in the field. Um, a a second-year grad student naturally doesn't know as much as a fifth-year graduate student. And it's the same issue. You know, in, in some of my other courses at Manoa, uh, I've had undergraduates sitting in with graduate students on a fairly high-level course. Clearly, you don't grade the undergraduate quite as tough as you would do a graduate student. Um, and in this particular case with the um, ThinkTech shows, you would like the students who really have sort of worked very hard to, to get more credit um, as opposed to just recycling uh, a conference presentation they gave last month. In general, how did they do? I thought they were excellent. And so none of them really stumbled um, we didn't say anything unrepeatable on the air. Um, we, we had a coherent discussion in each case. So, you know, I, I was just delighted with the way the whole series turned out. And, you know, I'm hoping that uh, sometime in the future, uh, the powers that be at SOS will see worthwhile doing this again. Uh, what did you learn about how to do this? Um, it, it Because I've won uh, a similar think tech series in the past, it was easier for me just to fall back into the same routine um, for these shows. Um, what I did learn is that it's really helpful for the students um, to practice this kind of thing. Um, on the previous Think Tech shows, uh, one of my guests, she'd never been on live TV before, never been interviewed, but she then graduated moved to NASA, got our space flight center, and three months later at a national press conference where she was discussing some of her results, she said it was really helpful just to do think tech. So um, I think it really is valuable experience for the students, for the interviewer, who cares? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it, I think <laughs> you enjoy it. So there's, there's that. Oh, yeah, there, there is that point, yeah. So um, one last thing I want to ask you about, you referred to the fact that this could happen, may happen, hopefully will happen again. Uh, and, you know, the powers in Manoa will have to make that decision and you'll have to be available for it and so forth. But when you do it again, will it be the same? Will it be different? What changes would you make? How would you organize it in, you know, an optimal way, in a way that you see as the best possible, you know, parameters, the best possible configuration going forward? Um, the main problem I've had has been on some occasions finding the diversity of student guests. All right. We were biased towards the earth science students as opposed to atmospheric sciences or oceanography. So I would like more preparatory work done so I actually didn't spend half the time the previous week before the show just trying to find a guest, all right? Um, I think uh, the format is really pretty good. I, I don't believe that having it as a formal course where all the students have to sign up for the entire semester would actually work. Um, the other issue, if it was a course, it would mean that you just had a random selection of students appearing one at a time on the show, um, I deliberately picked individuals who I thought had something interesting to say, which means it's not as helpful to the students who would need practice giving a presentation like this, um, but may not have been the ones that were selected. So trying to um, be more inclusive of the types of students that we have within SOS so that everybody has this opportunity and hopefully gets the experience that that needs a bit of work i don't think that 
doing it as a formal course would really uh, solve this problem, but sort of greater diversity and helping the students who really are more self-conscious about giving presentations because they have to go away to national or international conferences to give talks. That's more scary, I think, than talking to me for half an hour, uh, as well as, you know, when they go and get a job, uh, whatever, if it's in academia or in business, they, they still have to give presentations. So this guidance on um, making it simple enough to be understood, as well as um, having an idea of how to lead the story. I think is really important. So yes, striving to um, achieve those goals, I think is really important. Well, I can only say, Pete, it was great to have this series on ThinkTech. We love this kind of series about science and, and we love having you on. You are part of our family for many years, going way, way back to radio days. And let me add one other thought. Um, and that is that we have always felt that science should be made public. To the public, Indeed. to anybody who wants to watch. Um, and they may learn, um, you know, less than a graduate student would learn, but they would learn something. They would be right. exposed. Maybe they would make a decision, a career decision based on what they saw and heard on the show. And I think that's very valuable for the community. We have always encouraged uh, scientists like you and your students um, to talk at their level. And this goes way back in think tech's history. And you did, and you would. And you will. And right. this is a great, a great uh, contribution to the community conversation right. and to, to the careers that come out of UH. Well, thank you for saying that, Jay. Yes, I, I, and I should have added that, you know, sort of presenting the science to the community, recognizing that SOST is doing highly relevant research for the benefit of our community. You know, whether it's water or whether it's coral reefs or whether it's sea level rise or whether it's volcanic fog, these are all topics which impact everybody here in Hawaii. And I don't think that message gets out often enough to the community or our legislature. So this kind of thing with think tech has been really helpful from our point of view. And I too hope that we will come back again soon. I hope so. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much for joining me on this retrospective here today. And I hope that at some point in my life, I will be able to get a so shirt just like you have, Pete. <laughs> uh, there it is. Toast at UH Manoa. Pete McGinnis. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, Jack. Take care. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>